Hello? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, thanks for staying back. I think I still see a lot of people. I wasn't expecting that many people by this time, but uh, thank you for turning up. Um, my name is Sao Xiong, and uh, I'm going to talk about programming complexity today, about uh, modeling complex systems with Ruby and React. So um, a few years ago, I talked about something very similar. And uh, you, if you've been to that talk, you can consider this to be a part two of the same talk. Um, but to begin with, I just want to show this slide. So uh, Winston, this is for you. So <laughs> this is the first post I did um, in 2006, right, um, when we first created the uh, Singapore Ruby Brigade Google group. and. Uh, Chunkit was the one who created the group, and is he is Chunkit here? Oh, he left. Okay. Um, oh yeah, yeah, right. So he created the group, and uh, I quickly stooped him and uh, conquered the first post. So now you know what kind of friend I am, right? So <laughs> um, anyway, um, I just want to talk a little bit about myself, being the narcissist I am. Uh, so my name is Sao Xiong. Uh, this is my email. This is how you can reach me. And since we're down memory lane, um, I have actually been to a number of uh, Red Dot Ruby conference since 2001. So I've actually spoken since the first one till today, except for 2014. Uh, so this is my fifth time here uh, on the stage. And uh, I I'm totally overwhelmed by emotions. I, no, not really. Just kidding. Uh, um, so I recently changed jobs. So I was previously from PayPal, and uh, I recently changed to join a utilities company. So this is the company that uh, is government linked and provides power and uh, gas and uh, water to the whole of Singapore. So if you're interested to know why I make this really drastic change, you can come and approach me later on. But anyway, I have joined this company, and uh, there it is. Um, I've been doing Ruby for a very long time, I suppose, uh, 11 years now and, and counting. So, and, and along the journey, I actually wrote three books. And um, the, the most recent book, however, is, is one on uh, Go. So there is that as well. It's supposed to be released next month. So uh, if you're into web programming, say it's my pitch for you to buy my book. Yeah. Anyway, so um, I think a number of people talked about really in-depth um, technical topics today. And uh, I just want to say that uh, this is not one of them. <laughs> My presentation actually will show you no code. Uh, but I do have code, so if you want to see it later, you can actually go into this uh, GitHub repository and you can check out the code. Um, I can also show it to you if like, enough people shout and clap. Um, I will show it to you on uh, my text mate, uh, which is what I use. Anyway, um, <clears throat> let me start with the, uh, the topic I want to talk about today. Uh, basically, I want to talk about complexity. Um, complexity, what is it? It's not just about having uh, systems that are very complicated and very difficult to understand. Um, this actually has a, quite a, a definite term. It is about a behavior that images from a group of interacting parts but it's not directly the result of interactions between those individual parts. Uh, basically, something that comes out of individual parts, but it doesn't look as if it is from those parts. Uh, let me just illustrate very quickly with um, a familiar example. So you have seen like flocking birds. So each bird actually follow a very simple um, would say behavior. They would just follow the bird in front of it. It would try not to crash into the bird and would generally move in the direction that the bird is moving. But the resultant um, swarm of birds that you see is something that is, is not what you would expect from just the birds following a few simple rules. In the same way, um, a schooling group of fish has the same behavior. So this, this is what I mean by complexity. Certain behavior arising from uh, things, individual things that are happening that you do not expect. And what I'm trying to do today in this talk is talk about uh, certain types of complexity um, problems. And uh, those problems have already been modeled. So what I'm going to talk about today is not something new altogether. Some of it are actually pretty old. In fact, there's, well, there's one uh, uh, topic that I'm going to talk about is was actually uh, written about before I was born. So you can imagine how old it is. 
uh, let me jump into the first one. So um, the first one I'm going to talk about is about modeling cultural interactions. And since this is the year of Euro 2016, I just have to show you this picture. Anyone understand this? Yeah. I suppose most people understand this. Yeah. Um, so cultural interactions, right? So expectations and, and how you would uh, uh, interpret them in terms of uh, culture. Um, some other examples, like Mickey Mouse in Disneyland. How many of you have actually been to the Disneyland in Tokyo? Yeah. You notice that Mickey Mouse actually speaks in Japanese? <laughs> and Donald Duck and everybody else. Right? So um, it was totally mind-blowing for me when I was there. Um, Starbucks in Beijing, in the Forbidden City. Um, Chinese food in America. Um, yoga. I, um, and also this monstrosity. I, I don't really know what to call it, but uh, apparently it's called pizza. Uh, um, so I think what I'm trying to show here is that cultures do interact with each other and um, strange things happen subsequently. And somebody actually wrote something about it in uh, 1997, um, American political scientist, his name is Robert Axelrod. So I actually did some simulations based on his work in a previous talk. Um, what he did was, uh, I mean, he's also a complexity theory researcher and a National Medal of Science laureate. So he's someone important and someone really, really smart. So he actually built a model based on uh, two assumptions, a model of, of cultural interactions based on two assumptions. The first is that people are more likely to, um, that who are similar to each other are more likely to interact. And uh, when cultures interact with each other, um, they become more alike each other. So, I mean, if you think back a little bit about the few examples I showed you just now, yes, that's some of the examples. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a, an agent-based model where each agent represents a culture, and then I'm going to just throw them into, into this uh, experiment that I'm going to run, and we're going to see what happens, right? So let's look at the, the experiment. Um, I define culture as a set of features. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the features meaning like language, religion, the way that you dress, uh, the kind of food you eat, and so on and so forth. And um, within each feature, um, there are a set of possible traits. So the trait is a possible value of a particular feature. And then I model the uh, cultures in a 36 by 36 screen where each cell represents a, a culture. So a, a, each cell represents a culture. And um, each culture has six features. And each feature has 16 possible traits. Right? So, Question is, why did I choose uh, 6 and 16? What do you think? Yes? No? Not at all in this group? Thank you, team. <laughs> so it's a lazy man's way of um, representing the, the, the model. Basically, I used um, the colors, right? So uh, hex color code, so red, green, and blue. So six values, and each one of these I have 16 uh, possible uh, traits. And so the simulation goes this way. I have, for every culture, they, are, they have eight possible neighbors, unless you're in a border or at a corner. And the algorithm goes this way. Um, at every tick, I randomly pick n number of cells, and I will compare the features of the culture with each of the neighbors. If the trait difference for the same feature within two cultures is less than um, T, then I will randomly copy the trait of the feature to the other culture. A lot of words, let me just um, show them to you in more visual way. So let's say A and B are two neighboring cultures. And culture A has this particular value, culture B has this particular value. I take each of the trait and then compare them. So in this case, I take uh, the trait in um, three, right, in cell three, and I compare them, the difference is three. I do that for every single one of them. In the end, I add them all up, and uh, the difference between these two cultures becomes 34. Right. Now, of course, if they are totally different, then the uh, difference is 96. And if they are totally the same culture, um, there is no difference, it's zero. So the more similar the two cultures are, the more likely there will be culture exchange. Therefore, the probability of this culture exchange is 1 minus the difference between the two cultures, divided by 96. Simple arithmetic. Um, calculate the probability, 
in this case for that particular example. And when the interaction do happens, I copy one trait to the other. And therefore, as you can see here, um, one trait, sorry, one culture influences the other. Um, one trait is copied from one to the other, and therefore uh, something changes, right? There's an interaction. So what do we want to measure here? So we, we actually run a simulation. What do you want to measure? So in particular, I want to run, um, I want to measure three things. Um, the first is the average feature distance. This tells us how different each um, culture are from each other at the end of each simulation, at each round of simulation. The uniques tell us how many unique cultures are at, uh, they are at any given point in time. And uh, lastly, the uh, changes tell us how vibrant the cultural exchanges are. Right? So I want to measure these three particular uh, uh, points for the simulation. And uh, I will just very quickly run the simulation. Um, so I'm going to use Puma. Okay. Uh, I'm going to run the simulation. OK, so that's, this, this is live, by the way. So uh, let me just show you. So I'm going to start the simulation. You see from the chart on the chart on the left, you have blue, which is the distance between the average distance between uh, two cultures. And red is the number of changes. And yellow is the number of uniques. Right? Um, you see over time, the average distance reduces. So over time, you see, as the experiment goes, the differences between the cultures actually reduce. Um, the number of uniques also reduce, because as time goes by, cultures become more and more like each other. And finally, you can see that um, the, the differences Sorry, the, the changes there has always changed, right? And um, you can see it here on the nicely kind of, uh, changing colors that um, you see that there are certain big blotches of a particular color. That means basically a culture has dominated that particular uh, 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 simulation, right? And uh, over time, you see that it doesn't remain uh, constant. Um, some parts of it turn green, sometimes turn them yellow, and other parts of it turn blue. Okay, I'm going to stop the, this for now, get back to the slides. Uh, whoops. Okay. So this is a simulation. And over a period of time, because I'm, I'm not going to run the entire simulation to your presentation, but over time, this is, is roughly what you get. Um, the yellows, which represent the, the number of uniques, actually dropped to a particular constant. The changes remain the same. And the distance actually do not drop down to zero, right? or doesn't actually drop below uh, the number of uniques. So let's, let's look at some observations. Now, um, again, as I say, this is a simulation. I didn't actually plan any of this. And these are just observations from the simulation. Um, eventual equilibrium is that there are a few dominant cultures. That's also to be expected. So as cultures, cultures interact with each other, uh, one will eventually dominate. The dominant cultures can be quite different from each other. So we look that colors can be very different from each other. Um, so if I actually reduce the number, this, uh, the area, I use a 36 by 36 grid uh, because it looks pretty. But um, I could use a smaller one. Or I could use a bigger one. Um, smaller areas results in faster equilibrium and smaller number of cultures. So you have a smaller geographic space. You would expect that um, there is actually more changes and uh, there are fewer dominant cultures. But I suppose one thing that um, I didn't really expect in the end, which I, I, I observe here, is that a culture that is more dominant at one point in time doesn't mean it will be dominant in the end. Like, um, so, and dominant cultures doesn't mean one culture basically uh, dominates the other. Basically, in the end, is not not when two cultures interact, they form actually form a separate culture, uh, subculture that's based on two, and that's the one that becomes dominant. So, in a way, that's a simulation of how cultures interact. If you want to make more observations or you want to try variants, please feel free to take the code. Um, it's on GitHub. So now that's culture. Let me talk about another um, simulation um, about racial segregation. Uh, Singapore is a really very, I mean, for those visitors here, and uh, you realize Singapore is actually very racially um, 
diverse. There's a lot of diversity here. So I think racial segregation is something that's important in Singapore. And increasingly around the world, you probably notice that uh, uh, you know, as, as uh, different uh, uh, people move into other countries and so on, um, segregation of people of different races or different cultures and ba uh, background become increasingly important. So I think this is an interesting model. But uh, again, take it with a pinch of salt. This is a computer simulation model. This is not a reflection of real life. Yeah. So um, in 2000, a cartographer called Bill Rankin, what he did was he did a, a uh, he took a map and he basically took every like 25 people within a, uh, uh, and then he would put a color to the race of that person, uh, of those people. And he created a map. And what came out was quite startling. Uh, you see there are three blotches of blue, pink, and orange, and they represent the different races in, in Chicago. Um, so very obviously, there is some kind of racial, racial segregation, uh, sometimes at very sharp edges. If you look at uh, the blues and, and the oranges, there's sometimes just a dividing line to it. So that's, that's pretty stark. Um, is it only Chicago? Probably not. So. Uh, other cities in in U.S. were also, uh, I mean, th same things happened in other cities, and uh, same things were done uh, for other cities, and uh, this came out as a result. And in Detroit, I think that uh, seems pretty serious. It's like blue and then pink. Um, New York, L.A., Washington D.C. Um, some other countries around the world were also, I mean, some other cities around the world were also. Were also uh, um, uh, use and London also showed something very similar. So the question comes is like, um, why is there such segregation? London is supposed to be one of the most racially um, diverse cities in the world. Right? So what, what is really happening? Is it inevitable? Is segregation inevitable? So um, Thomas Schelling is an like American economist, uh, 2005 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. I made a mistake of, of saying that this that Thomas Schelling won the Nobel Prize for Economics once and got really bashed up quite a lot. So I'm very careful to say that he actually won the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. Um, so he, he wrote this paper in 1971 called The Dynamic Models of Segregation, where he did a simulation on how races were, were being segregated. Right? Um, the way that he did it is very different from the way that I'm going to use today. Because what he did was basically he used a grid of uh, 12 by 12, 12 by 12 coins, and then uh, he flipped the coins, right, whenever there's some interaction. What I'm going to do today is absolutely not that. I'm not going to use coins. Um, I have computers to help me, so I'm going to do a simulation. I'm going to use exactly the same model that I, I used earlier on, 36 by 36 grid, uh, eight neighbors each. But the algorithm is slightly different now. At every tick, I will check every cell instead of a, a random set of cells. Um, if at least n number of its neighbors are the same race, I wouldn't do, uh, do anything, right? So imagine every household occupies one cell, and um, if I find that the races around me are of um, the, the my neighbors are of the same race, I won't do anything. But if they are more racist, uh, I would say that a uh, certain threshold, there are more neighbors who are of different race than I am, then I would try to find somewhere else to move to, or pick an empty cell and I move there. So what are the parameters I'm, I'm going to measure um, and that I'm going to use to sort of uh, do the simulation? So first is acceptable number of neighbors, um, which means like uh, the more neighbors, uh, the, the larger the n is, the more acceptable I am to, to um, uh, that I'm actually OK with living with a, a diverse um, a neighborhood. Uh, the second one is, is the number of races on the grid. So I will start off with two. But then, as you see, I will increase the number of races in the overall grid. Then the percentage of vacant cells. Of course, if there are zero vacant cells, basically I can't move anywhere. Therefore, it's kind of a, a useless simulation. But if I increase the percentage of vacant cells, does that help? Is it better if uh, it's more spacious? Would there be more segregation otherwise? So that's one of the uh, uh, parameters I'm playing with. And lastly, I use a policy limitation. So uh, this has been used in many countries where you say that certain percentage of a particular area cannot have uh, like a majority of certain race or, or so on. So that's policy limitation. I want to also simulate to see whether is that useful? Is that something that would be 
helpful to reduce uh, segregation. So let me run the simulation uh, here. Uh, well, this is finishing. You can see the dominant races here just now. The dominant cultures here. Right? So let me go here. So I set the acceptable number of uh, neighbors to be two. Number of races two. Twenty percent of the cells are vacant, and uh, uh, the quota here, uh, basically the policy, is, is eight. So we set up again. It's randomly assigned. What I'll do is I'll start the simulation, and as you can see, um, the simulation quickly becomes segregated. Right. So with this particular set of parameters it becomes segregated quickly. So let me just um, increase the acceptable number of neighbors. Set up again. So you see early on, there are actually large areas where there are people are segregated. So let's start the simulation again. Uh, okay, maybe it's just too much, yeah. Okay, let me just reduce it. Just three. Let's do that again. Um, Again, you see segregation, but you notice there's something different now. It's, uh, it's even bigger blotches. Right. Um, and as you saw earlier on, as I increased the uh, acceptable number of neighbors, and it started again, um, something strange happens. It keeps moving. It doesn't actually stabilize, right? It doesn't actually come to a steady state. So that tells us certain things as well. So again, I, I can change the number of uh, races here. Set up. Okay, this is probably a wrong number to use. Okay, set up. And you can, you can see that there's actually segregation with the races. Right, and this stabilizes. Uh, if I go up to four, it actually does not stabilize. So up to four, um, it will go into a continuous loop. Let me get back to the slides. I'm, I'm not going too fast, right? It's, it's okay? Yeah. Okay, so talk about that just now. Simulation. Again, my observations, and um, as, as I mentioned earlier on, you can take the same code that I used and uh, play around with it. Feel free to just uh, muck around with it and, and, and try out your own simulations. Um, so segregation happens even there's a weak preference for neighbors of the same type. So um, even if I'm very acceptable to having neighbors of different races, segregation happens. Um, the weaker the preference, though, the less segregated it will be. So if I'm, I am okay with uh, diverse, uh, uh, different kind of neighbors, then the clusters become smaller, which is good news. Basically, we are, we are saying that um, the less um, races we are, then uh, the, the less segregated we will be, which is, is the good news for us overall. Um, the stronger the preference, the more segregated. Uh, that's the that's, uh, opposite of what I said earlier on. At a particular threshold, though, um, the strong preferences result in an unstable but non-segregated state. So it's good. It's good that it's non-segregated, but at the same time, people keep moving. So that's no good. Uh, that basically means it's, it's, it's a chaos, right? The, the, uh, the, where, where the city is in the chaos, the province, the state, whatever it is, is, is in constant move. Um, the number of races act, have no impact to segregation. This is a little bit surprising, um, but n you have two different races, you were segregated in two clumps, you have 10 different races, you were just segregated into 10 different clumps. And the number of vacant cells have no impact to segregation. The larger the area is, the more vacant the city is, um, that has no particular impact, you will still be segregated. And lastly, policy enforcement has limited impact on segregation. So it does have certain uh, impact because you do get people to not be so segregated. But at the same time, if you impose policies that are too strong, what happens is that uh, it will result in an unstable state, again, undesirable. Now, what is, what is the, the, uh, uh, the solution to this? I, I have no solution. I'm just running a simulation, right? So um, take, this, take the simulation, try it out, and, and see what happens. OK, so I've done um, two simulations now. I'm going to switch gears a little bit to something slightly different. Um, I'm going to model something called the bystander effect. 
So this is a very famous case. Um, in 1964, a 19-year-old girl called Kitty Genovese in New York um, recently graduated from high school. She was working in a bar and she was walking home and she was attacked by an intruder. And um, what happened was she, she was actually attacked a couple of times and it was, it's not in bright daylight, but it was close enough to an apartment block. And apparently, at least from this sensationalist uh, headline, it says that 37 people saw the murder, but didn't do anything about it. So that was like a, a big wake up call for a lot of people to say, what's happening to this world? Are we so in, so desensitized to violence that we no longer care about the people around us? And uh, that was in 1964. Um, in October 2001, in uh, Forsa, in, in, in China, um, a two-year-old girl was hit by a white van and then uh, run over by a truck again. And uh, she was basically not helped by any bystander until about, uh, I mean, like a large group of people basically ignored her until after a while, uh, until she was actually rescued uh, quite a while later. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away as a result of that. So again, there's another example of um, what certain people call the bystander e effect. Um, and the bystander effect is something that's been talked about in game theory. And so this is the next thing that I'm going to model. Um, game theory is a study of mathematical models. So it's, it's mathematics, more mathematics here, within conflict and cooperation and is used in economics and political science. And um, I th it's an example I will use for complexity science as well. So the particular uh, topic is what is called volunteer's dilemma. Basically, um, if there's a large group of people witnessing something, and if he or she, does he or she volunteer or not? Because there is a cost to volunteering, and there's a cost to not volunteering, right? So modeling that in, um, with mathematics, you have uh, variables, you have V, which is a value gain if at least one person volunteers, which means like if somebody actually volunteer and shout and say stop, um, stop their murderer or whatever, the thief or, or robber or whatever, uh, then that act would have been stopped. Um, but at the same time, individual cost of volunteering. For volunteer, maybe it takes up their time, maybe it calls attention to them and therefore they will be attacked instead of the other person. And of course, there's the overall cost is no one volunteers. So what's, what's the cost uh, of that when no more than volunteers? In which case we saw earlier just now, people actually died uh, when no one volunteers. So it is actually a tragedy. So um, game theory actually has something called a payoff matrix. While the payoff matrix for those cases I showed just now is, is much larger, I will just start off with a two-player game, right, where uh, it's you and me. and um, in the case of, say, uh, so you have you and me, and you, you form a matrix where I volunteer or you volunteer. In cases where um, I, want, um, I volunteer and you volunteer or you don't volunteer, it seems to be the same. There doesn't seem to be any difference. Um, if I don't volunteer, whether you volunteer or you don't volunteer, there is a difference, right? So V and V minus A. So using this, um, payoff matrix, we come up with something called a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, which is actually the best case for the game theory. Um, so we have this equation, V minus C equals to the P, P is the probability of volunteering, multiplied by V plus and so on and so forth. So with this particular equation, we change it to an N player game. So instead of having just two players, we change to N player and the probability of volunteering becomes n minus one. So instead of p, it becomes p to the power of n minus one. Right? And therefore, the probability of not volunteering is one minus p to the power of n minus one. Of course, if you put everything together, you come up with this particular um, formula, and uh, then you derive it, you get into a final formula. Right? So that's the mathematics part of it. Um, what I do with this particular probability, then um, I run some Monte Carlo simulation on it, and I'll show you the, uh, the model. No, it's still going on, yeah. All right, so this is the volunteer's dilemma. So the um, X axis is the number of agents, basically number of players, or number of witnesses, or, or what have you not. 
and the y-axis is the probability of volunteering, right? Whether is it likely that somebody would volunteer and say something about it, right? So let's look at increasing or decreasing the cost of volunteering. So if I decrease the cost of volunteering, naturally we would realize that, uh, okay, it's less costly to volunteer, therefore more people will volunteer. And, and as you can see, that, that's true, right? Because um, if it becomes trivial for me to volunteer, then there will be more people volunteering, right? Um, and of course, if the cost of volunteering is larger than the overall cost, then there's, nobody will volunteer. Now let's look at it the other way around. Uh, overall cost of um, volunteering. If the overall cost of volunteering, if I don't volunteer and do something, then um, there will be total disaster. If I don't shout fire, when there's a fire, the whole block burns down, everybody dies, right? So that's the worst case possible. So if I increase the cost of volunteering, um, of not volunteering, um, then basically what happens is that, um, of course, the likelihood of somebody volunteering uh, increases as well. Right. So you can see something interesting though, as I, as I show you this particular model. Um, at the start, the probability of, with the three agents, with three players, the probability of volunteering is 62%. As the number of agents increases, the probability of volunteering actually decreases. So if we, if we sort of reflect back to the uh, example that I gave just now, Kitty Genovese. So if there was actually just one person witnessing the murder, then the probability of that person actually shouting out and uh, maybe scaring off the attacker might be a lot higher than say there were 37 people, right? So you can see that, um, that being modeled here. So let's look at the, the last piece that I wanted to, um, the last parameter that I wanted to, to model, um, increasing the number of agents. Do you realize what's happened here? It doesn't really matter how many agents they are. Right? The, the probability is just the same. Right? It doesn't mean that the more people witness something, then the more likely somebody will shout loud. Yeah, that's, that's not the case. Right? Now, what does this tell us? Well, uh, let me get back to the slides. Uh, again, I'm just running a simulation. I'm not telling you uh, what happens. Because I, I mean, this is a simulation. This is not the real life. Um, observations. What can we do? So first of all, we need to decrease the, the cost of volunteering. If we don't want such tragedies, tragedies to happen, we should decrease the cost of volunteering. Make it easier for people to volunteer. Um, increase the overall cost or, or impact of not volunteering. Of course, we don't really want that, right? You don't want to make things worse if uh, nobody volunteers. But nonetheless, that is a way of uh, uh, increasing the probability of somebody volunteering. volunteering. Um, you notice again, it's actually not really about the exact number, the absolute numbers, but it's the difference between the individual cost and the overall cost. So maybe the answer is really to, um, while you reduce the overall cost, but you also make it such that the difference between the individual cost and the overall cost are very high. Right? Um, this is a bit counterintuitive because if you reduce the number of players, uh, number of agents, basically what happens is there's likelihood of probabil the probability of voluntary increases. So that's, that's maybe what should uh, happen. Um, not necessarily for a, an accident. In such case, it's, um, it's possible because there are just so many people there. But maybe there are other ways of maybe anonymously volunteering, right? So that could be a, a way of doing something uh, to reduce the number of players. Um, and finally, the observation here is that increasing the number of players have negative or even uh, have no impact or even a negative impact on the overall uh, probability of volunteering. Right. So, um, hope you guys are still with me. Yeah. Right. So I've actually come to the end of the, the, this talk. I hope it has been interesting for you. Uh, if you want to, you can actually take a look at the GitHub repository. I have this here. Um, just feel free to play around with it. And if you have any sort of uh, questions, please feel free to ask as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sashong. Uh, anyone, uh, would anyone like to pose a question for him? Okay. Sir, 
switch here? Or? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, you said if we shouted and screamed, you'd show us a bit of the code. So I thought I'd ask this question. Okay. Uh, uh, you showed basically three different simulations, and I'm wondering uh, 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 what commonalities underlying the, the code. Maybe that would be an interesting way to sh show off the code. What do you think? Um, I can show you. You don't need to shout, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Well, let me just increase the size. So <clears throat> basically, this is I, I use. I use Sinatra um, because it's simple enough, right? Um, Sinatra and JSON. And I create three different simulations here. Um, the first one is the culture simulation. And uh, it uses a grid. So grid, simple, it's, it's quite simple uh, kind of uh, algorithm. Um, culture, I use a combination of the, uh, the bit mask to sort of uh, make the dif to tell differences and uh, some very simple algorithms to just find the distance between the two, dif two different numbers and so on. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to show it because it's not very sexy nor you know, very complicated, right? It's, it's just so simple, right? Um, simple code is sexy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't fishing for it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, um. yeah, so I hope that's okay. One last um, question. Okay, thank you. Regarding the volunteer's dilemma, where does um, personal choice, freedom of thought come in, in terms of attitudes? Uh, so I think definitely those things do count, um, except that this is a mathematical model. So it basically models um, a large group of people. It's a bit like psychohistory, if you guys read Asimov. No, never mind. Um, but uh, st it is statistical, statistical, whatever. It's a mathematical modeling. So, uh, yeah, um, individual will does count, but I think in this case, I, I didn't uh, put that in into the model. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Sounds strong. Um, thank you. you know,